Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video. Today we've got one that you guys have kind of been requesting a lot. I've had a lot of people ask that I do some more UK based cases and I do do a lot of cases that are based in America and over in Australia and it's not any kind of favouritism, it's just because a lot more people tend to go missing under mysterious circumstances over in the US. Honestly I find it quite difficult to find really interesting strange missing persons cases that have happened over here in the UK which to be honest kind of makes me feel a little bit safer. <laughs> so yes today's case is based in the UK and I've also had a lot of people requesting that I do some solved cases on my channel and to be honest this is probably the closest to a solved case that I'm ever going to talk about. Although technically we still don't know who murdered Susie we kind of do and I'm going to tell you the story of Susie Lamplew. So Susie Lamplew was a 25 year old English estate agent. She lived and worked in London, she lived in Putney and worked over the river in Fulham. She went missing on the 28th of July 1986 and then she was officially declared dead eight years later in 1994 even though her body has never been found. Susie was an independent young professional, like I said she was 25 years old, she was totally independent, she lived on her own, she had quite a successful job. This was the 1980s where women were really starting to go into the workplace, although women obviously had been working for years beforehand, the 80s was kind of a revelation for women working. She was very powerful and professional and independent and she lived what you can only assume was a great life. She had a very tight knit group of friends, she had a good job, I'm assuming she was earning very good money as well. At the time of her disappearance she had worked at Sturgis and Sons estate agents in Fulham for over a year. So on the morning of the 28th of July Susie went to work like any other day. She dressed in a peach blouse, a grey skirt and black shoes and went into work. The morning was like any other then at 12.40pm is where things went wrong. Susie left the office to go and show a home to a client. Susie took her keys and her purse with her. Her purse had £15 cash and credit cards in but she left her handbag behind in the office so clearly she intended to go back to the office at some point. Susie's office diary recorded the main details of the appointment. Of course this was the 80s so things were done written by hand, nothing was really done on computers or electronically and in her diary she had written 1245 Mr Kipper 37 Sherald's Road O slash S and the O slash S meant meeting outside. 10 minutes later, what we can assume was about 12.50pm, a witness later reported that they had seen Susie waiting outside the property as was planned. Then at 1pm, a neighbour was looking out their window and saw a young man join Susie, who we can only assume is Mr Kipper. This man was dressed immaculately, he was wearing a suit and fancy shoes. The neighbour who saw him said that he was actually a very good looking guy and he estimated his age between about 25 and 30. Now from what I could find it says that the same neighbour saw Mr Kipper and Susie walking away from the property a few minutes later. Now I couldn't actually figure out if they had been inside the property in this time, I'm guessing they had because house viewings don't tend to take that long. Um, so I'm guessing they met, they went inside the property and then they walked out again. And this is where the timeline gets a little bit skewed. So I did read a report that some witnesses saw Susie arguing with that same man in Sharrod's Road. After they argued, they were both seen getting into a car and I think the car that they were seen getting into was Susie's white Ford Fiesta. Now a van driver later reported that he was driving down Stevenage Road and he actually had to stop and beep his horn because Susie's white Ford Fiesta came speeding around the corner and nearly crashed into him. And the driver said that he saw Susie in the car looking distressed with a man, a good looking man, sat next to her. This man matching the same description of Mr Kipper. But there was another similar property for sale in Stevenage Road. So there's a very good chance that Susie showed Mr Kipper around the first property and then thought she would take him to see this other similar property about a mile and a half away on Stevenage Road. Now I'm not sure how commonplace it would have been for Susie to maybe invite this man into her car and say I'll drive round. Especially when this man had a car of his own from what I could gather. But maybe that's what happened. And this is where things are a little bit weird as well. Some other witnesses reported seeing Susie and a good looking man sitting in a nearby park with a bottle of champagne. And from what I can gather, these witnesses didn't say they looked distressed or Susie didn't look like she was being harmed in any way. They were just sharing a bottle of champagne. A shopkeeper later came forward and said that that morning he had sold a good looking man a bottle of champagne. A guy had come into the shop and asked for the most expensive, best bottle of champagne he had. And then the shopkeeper gave over the champagne. 
Mr. Kipper, we're assuming it was, gave over the money and just walked out, didn't even wait for his change. So I'm really not sure about the timeline here. At what point did the witnesses see Susie and this man with the bottle of champagne? Maybe it was after the Sherrods Road appointment and then before they'd gone to Stevenage Road. I'm not entirely sure. Susie was good at her job. She was professional, she was reliable and she always sort of went by the rules and regulations. So when Susie didn't return back to the office, her colleagues started to worry a little bit. That afternoon, Susie's manager called Diana Lamplu, Susie's mum, and asked her if she had seen her daughter or had heard from her because Susie hadn't turned back up at the office. Of course, Diana hadn't heard from Susie and she immediately went into overdrive because it was so unlike her daughter to just disappear and not tell anyone where she was. At 6.45 p.m. and they still hadn't heard from Susie for nearly six hours at this point, her manager called the police. The police immediately shot into action. This was a responsible, reliable 25-year-old woman, an estate agent who was meeting random people all day long and now she had gone missing. They immediately knew that something could have happened to her. So they searched, they retraced all of Susie's steps that day that they knew of, and eventually around 10.01 p.m. that night, came across Susie's white Ford Fiesta parked in Stevenage Road. The driver's door was unlocked, the handbrake was off, and her purse had been left in the glove compartment, and her keys were gone. There was no sign of a struggle, and there were no fingerprints in the car that were unaccounted for, However, the seat was pulled back into a position that Susie wouldn't have driven it in and it seemed like somebody else had been driving her car. Now the search for Susie Lamplu was one of the biggest missing person searches that was ever done by UK police. This was a big scale operation. Now this was the 80s and social media wasn't a thing back then and word of mouth didn't work the same way so the police immediately went to the media and the next day the headlines on all of the big papers was the search for Susie Lamplu. Police were begging for witnesses to come forward and from what I can gather, a lot of witnesses did come forward but it didn't really lead to anything. Although this was a massive, massive police operation, they never found anything and it wasn't until years and years later that they started to put together the pieces of what possibly could have happened to her. Years later, in 1999, someone came forward who was jogging in the area and said that that day they had seen a man and woman struggling in a black BMW. This was very close apparently to where Susie's car was abandoned in Stevenage Road and unusually the jogger said the car may have been a left-hand drive which obviously is strange because over here in the UK we have right-hand drive. The reason this came out so late in 1999 is in 1998 the police actually reopened the inquiry into Susie's disappearance and then a whole load of new information came forward. This is 13, well 12, 13 years after Susie first disappeared. Now a side note I want to talk about here because I'm sure I get a lot of people commenting about how Susie was irresponsible to not have all this information written down, like to be meeting a random person on her own. And what I want to say is it was the 1980s, it was such a different time than it is now. This was 30 years ago. Women were getting more responsibility in the workplace and it wasn't thought of as strange that a woman could be an estate agent and go meet this person on her own. And the Susie Lamplu disappearance itself actually brought through a whole host of new rules and regulations for estate agents. From what I can gather, there's now a lot more safety regulations put in place, especially for women who are meeting random men on their own. This was the 80s and it was Susie's responsibility to make sure that her diary had all the information in it that she needed to have. And although she'd written down the name Mr. Kipper, Mr. Kipper was nowhere in the Sturgis and Sons estate agent's records. They had never had a client by that name before and they had no number to contact this guy. He was just a completely random person. A lot of people actually think that Mr. Kipper is a play on words and is actually short for kidnapper, which just is sick in my view. That is awful because that shows that somebody had pre-planned this. This wasn't a crime of opportunity. This wasn't somebody saw Susie on her own and thought, oh yes, a female on her own, I can take her. This was pre-planned. I've never heard of anyone with that surname ever and it kind of makes sense that this probably was a play on the word kidnapper. Whoever did this to Susie had probably been stalking her for quite a while before it happened, but we'll get to that in a little bit. It was publicly admitted by the police years later that they made a lot of mistakes in the original inquiry into Susie's disappearance. There were so many leads that they didn't follow through and they actually didn't even listen to Susie's parents when they gave the police some very vital information in this case. So in the months before her disappearance, Susie had actually met someone. She was kind of dating a guy from Bristol and he kind of was a little bit weird. I think it started out, they met in a bar in Fulham 
and it kind of started out exciting for Susie as this good looking attractive guy and she quite liked him however things took a bad turn quite quickly and this guy started to concern her and worry her a little bit. She questioned as to whether back home in Bristol this guy had a wife because he was constantly on the phone to someone in Bristol and he'd leave dates early and just kind of walk out. She told her mum that this guy had taken her motor racing on a date and this guy had actually really scared her. He was acting very erratically and he just wasn't acting like someone should on a date. He was really worrying her. So she spoke to her parents about it and she kind of came to the conclusion that this wasn't going to work out. Why would she want to be with somebody who scared her? So she was planning on meeting this guy, taking him for lunch and telling him it's over. The parents were never sure what had happened with this because then Susie disappeared. And for you to fully understand the story, we're going to have to talk about the murder of another woman, a woman named Shirley Banks. So on the 8th of October 1987, about a year and a couple of months since Susie went missing, a woman named Shirley Banks was shopping at the Bristol Broadmead Shopping Centre and she planned to later meet her husband for drinks. But Shirley never turned up to these drinks with her husband and so her husband called the police and he was very concerned about her. The next morning, Shirley's husband still hadn't heard from her so called her workplace and asked if she had turned up for work and they actually said that just 15 minutes earlier, Shirley had called in sick with an upset stomach and she wasn't coming into work that day. Now clearly, Shirley's husband was so concerned he told the police all of the information and they started to search for her and couldn't find anything. This woman had, just like Susie, disappeared. Now let's fast forward to three weeks later, 29th of October, 1987. A man called John Canan is arrested for trying to assault two shop assistants at knife point. Police officers found Canan's car, a black BMW, close to the shop where he had tried to assault the two shop assistants. And inside the car, he had a rope and an imitation handgun. He searched his car and soon came across a tax disc in the glove compartment. This tax disc belonged to the car of Shirley Banks. Soon after that, the police found Shirley's mini clubman in the garage of John Canan's flat. He had painted it blue and changed the number plate to SLP 386S. Canan, of course, denied all involvement in Shirley Banks' disappearance. He said that he had bought the car off a Bristol car dealer for £100 just a few days earlier. Shirley Banks' decomposed body was found six months later on Easter Sunday in Quantock Hills in an area that's actually known as Dead Woman's Ditch. Canan was, of course, found guilty of the murder of Shirley Banks and was sentenced to life in jail. As Shirley Banks' murder wasn't the only thing he was charged with. He's also charged on the assault of the two shop assistants and he was charged with the rape of a woman in Reading. So I'm currently like halfway through editing this video and I've realised that a whole clip has just disappeared. So if this section is different from the rest of the other sections, then I've just lost like 15 minutes of footage. I've no idea what happened. Where I think I was is I was saying that John Canan is the main and only suspect in the murder of Susie Lamplew. The connections are just too much. There's too much there to say that it didn't happen. He matches all of the witness descriptions of the guy, Mr. Kipper, that Susie met that day. As I mentioned earlier, Canan changed the number plate on Shirley Banks' car and he changed it to SLP. 386S and a lot of people have made a connection to this being about Susie. SLP standing for Susie Lamplew, 386 being the year that she was murdered and then I'm not sure what the 3 and the S stand for but they just maybe just needed extra numbers on there. Obviously this is a very loose link and it could all just be a coincidence but I think it is interesting to note. Something else very very interesting here is that before Susie Lamplew was murdered John Canan had actually already been in prison. He had just served five years in prison for the rape of a woman and he had recently been released onto day release and he had been sent to London where he was on day release. He was allowed to leave and work and do what kind of he wanted during the day but he had to check back in the evenings for a curfew. So this day release was in Fulham, very close to where Susie worked and lived. And this would also explain if John Canan was the man that Susie was dating before she disappeared. This would explain why he sort of had to leave dates early. Susie had mentioned to her parents that she had met this guy while she was out at bars in Fulham. And people who were in this sort of halfway house with John at the time 
said that he would sneak out in the evenings to go to bars and he would brag about the woman, the young professional woman that he would meet in these bars. John Canan was officially arrested and questioned in connection to Susie's murder in December of 2000, but in November 2002, it was declared that there just wasn't enough evidence to link him to this case. And of course, at this time, he was already in prison for the murder of Shirley Banks. Something else very important to note is that John Canan was actually fully released from his day release prison just three days before Susie Lamplew went missing. And something that is so frustrating about this case is that it was the police that messed up here. After Susie went missing, they did not look at connections to local sex offenders, people who had been recently released from prison. They didn't look into that at all. And if you're asking me, that's kind of policing 101. You look into prisoners and you look into sex offenders. Susie's parents also gave the police vital information about this guy that scared Susie that she was dating. And the police just disregarded it. They didn't do anything with the information, which is what led to the public 2002 apology to Susie's parents saying that the police did mess up. And in another unprecedented step here at that same 2002 press conference, the police confirmed that John Canan was their only and prime suspect in this case. As early as 1990, John Canan's ex-girlfriend, or was his actual girlfriend at the time, a woman called Jilly Page, contacted the police saying that Canan had said that he had buried Susie. They were driving past the Norton Barracks one day where Canan pointed at the fields and said, Susie Lamplew is buried there. Jilly contacted the police and then later retracted her statement, whether it's because she thought she was mistaken or because she was scared, it's not known, but she did retract it. It was only nine years later, in 1999, Diana Lamplew received a letter to her home saying that Susie Lamplew was buried at Norton Barracks. A few months later, a massive search team, 30 police officers, took five days to fully search the Norton Barracks area. Only now it was fully built up and there were houses and there was concrete and there was tarmac laid down. So it made the search for Susie's body a lot more difficult. It is very well thought that John Canan is definitely the murderer of Susie Lamplew. However, he has always denied it. Um, he did admit once in an interview that it was him, but it is thought that he was just messing with the police. He retracted his statement and they couldn't use that as solid evidence. His cellmates in prison have said that he has admitted to them that he has killed Susie. But again, you can't take that as solid evidence because it could just be him trying to look big in front of his cellmates. He's also told his cellmates that he can never admit where Susie's body is buried because it's in a house and she's not alone, meaning that he has probably murdered other women as well. And possibly the most damning piece of evidence against John Canan in this case is that his prison nickname is actually Kipper. And although it sounds like there's loads of evidence here and he could so easily be charged for the murder of Susie Lamplew, it's all circumstantial and there's no actual solid evidence to link him to it. It's just word of mouth or rumours or things that he said and they're attracted. It's nothing solid. They need an actual piece of forensic evidence and there isn't any. Now just to remain fair in this case, I'm going to talk about a couple of other theories that have been thrown around. One theory is that Susie in her early 20s worked on a luxury cruise designer called the QE2. She was a beautician on board and at the same time that Susie worked on the ship, she worked with a man called Steve Wright who is now known as the Suffolk Strangler. He murdered five prostitutes in Ipswich in the space of just 10 days. Now of course there is a very obvious link between Susie and Steve and they even have pictures together. They were thought to have been friends on this ship. And although Steve and Susie did seem to keep in contact after they both left the ship, the link between them is very weak. There's actually no evidence whatsoever that would suggest that Steve had done this, it's just a loose link between the two of them and the police have said that he is not a suspect in this case. And of course there's also the theory that this could have been done by a completely random person. Maybe Susie was meant to meet Mr Kipper that day and he never turned up, instead a different person turned up and kidnapped her. Um, I do feel like this is a bit of a weak argument considering everything like that links John Canan to the name Kipper, but it is a possibility. In the aftermath of Susie's disappearance, her parents, Diana and Paul, set up a trust called the Susie Lamplew Trust. In the months before her death, Susie and Diana actually had a conversation where Diana was asking Susie to slow down a little bit and Susie said, no mum, life is for the living. And this is kind of the backbone of the trust. It's to teach people how to live life to the fullest, but to remain safe whilst doing so. Because Susie's parents believe that if she'd had more education into how to stay safe, 
especially in the job that she was in where she was meeting new people day in day out, then maybe bad things wouldn't have happened to Susie. The trust is still active to this day and is doing wonderful things. Susie's mum, Diana, actually died in 2011 and Paul stepped down from the trust to look after Diana before her death. But the charity is still very much up and running today. Let me know what you think. I know this case is pretty clear cut anyway. I'm like 99% sure that John Canan definitely did murder Susie and will never ever say where her body is buried. But I just wish that one day her body will be found just for the peace of mind of her father and the rest of her family. I hope you enjoyed this one. I know it's a little bit different to my regular mysteries, but it's definitely a very interesting case that needs to be talked about more, I think. So I will see you in my next video. Bye guys.